It's time for our scripture reading this morning. If you will please turn in your Bibles so that we can all read together. We have two different verses. One starts, uh, the first one is from the book of Luke, chapter 6, in verse 17. Luke chapter 6, verse 17 reads, And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. And our second verse, if you go back just a couple of books to the book of Matthew, in the 13th chapter, verse 44. Matthew 13, 44 reads, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Father in heaven, as we bow down before you, we pray that with your presence, with your spirit, you touch our hearts today and you speak to us and you change us. We pray that you bring revival, repentance, commitment. You bring that love that it was in the first century church. We pray in Jesus' merits. Amen. You'll see that not just in society, and not just among other Christians, but right here in the church. People come to church Sabbath by Sabbath. People keep Sabbath. People pay tithe, those who do. <clears throat> Hopefully we are all faithful. <clears throat> People love the Lord. Or at least they say so. They even eat clean. They eat all the broccoli and green beans. But you'll see that people still struggle. And they have little bits here and there that they don't want to give up. They keep them for themselves. And those little bits that we keep for ourselves are those things that choke our relationship with God, choke or stop God's full presence in our heart. So church, there are two categories of church people. I didn't say two categories of people. I want you to hear me. I'm not talking about outside people who don't believe in God. I'm talking about God's people. You hear me? Okay, there are two categories right in the church. There are those called the crowd. There are those called the disciples. And let's start. <clears throat> Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with his disciples and the great multitude. Let me stop right here and ask you, the multitude was who? God's people. It was Israel, okay? Could have been a visitor there, but 90% of them or more, it was God's people. A great multitude of people from all Judea, you see it? And Jerusalem and so on. They came to hear him and to be healed. So, let's go back. There are two categories of people. Who? The disciples and the crowd. Why don't you say it? Are you afraid of something? I didn't say you are the crowd. Come on. I mean, you are one of the two groups. I don't know. You know. God knows. Okay. So, two groups of people. Now, why did they come? What is the reason that they came to church? They came to? To hear? And they came to? Okay. Is it okay to come to hear the word? Oh, yes, absolutely. They came to hear a good sermon. It was Dwight Nelson speaking. They got their popcorn, they got their soda, another good program. Yeah, another good sermon. Hey, Dwight Nelson is speaking. And they, that was the 1,237 sermon that they heard in their lifetime. And when they left, they felt so good because they were impressed and touched and moved. But they didn't change it. You follow me? It is something to hear a sermon, to be moved. 
and something else to act on it. Some of them came to hear a sermon. Some of them came to, 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 to be blessed, to be healed, to be fed. There was potluck. Jesus fed 5,000, you know, for free. Yeah, believe it or not. Sometimes people love potlucks. Why not? It's good. There is nothing wrong with that. However, so some of them came because they wanted to be helped. They had a job problem. Some of them had a family problem. Some of them had a spiritual problem. Some of them had a sin problem. Some, they just wanted Jesus' blessing. They wanted to be blessed. But listen, church. All of this is good. There is nothing wrong to listen to a good sermon. There is nothing wrong to, to want a blessing from God, to want to be healed, to want to be forgiven, to want to be changed. There is nothing wrong with that. As long as you seek Jesus first. If you seek just the sermon without Jesus, if you seek just the healing without Jesus, basically you are looking for the gifts instead of looking for the giver of the gifts. You follow me? So, <clears throat> some of them were just there to hunt him because they didn't like him and they were looking for, they were taking notes from the sermon, not what is good. I love when people take notes, but not that they would repeat at home. Many came for sensational. We want to see a miracle. There is an accident and everybody slows down, not because they think it's dangerous to drive by. But they want to see it. People are curious. They like sensation. They want to see a miracle. They were in the church, but not for the right reason. There were some of them that actually worked in the church and helped in the church, but without looking for Jesus. They thought they were looking for Jesus, but they were not willing to give Jesus the seat. Oh, they did give Jesus part of the seat. The disciples versus the crowd. You see... <clears throat> The disciples was willing to sacrifice everything without any reservation at any time daily for Jesus. The crowd would choose and pick what to sacrifice and when. And they would interpret the words somehow to their convenience so they could do what they do and think that they do what is good. They would be moved, impressed, feel good about it and never change. How many people do that in our church? I don't know if you like it. I'm glad it's not about us here. Let me ask you, are you the crowd or are you the disciple? The disciple would follow Jesus 100%. The crowd would follow Jesus 95%. Is it bad, 95%? Huh? Huh? Oh, yes, it is. I thought you said, well, not too bad. I, like, I, I love Jesus some. <clears throat> Let's see. The kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. A man finds the treasure and he hides it back. And then for joy over the treasure, he goes and sells everything. And then he goes and buys that field. The kingdom of God is like, wow, this is amazing, this is breathtaking, this could change my life forever, this is just unbelievable. Am I right? I mean, we don't talk about one or two or three or five millions, we talk about unbelievable, unmeasurable value. It, it, it has the potential to totally change your entire life and your family and everybody related to you. Am I right? People who found the treasure should be the happiest people on earth. How do you explain that we come to church and we think we found the treasure and we look like we are beaten with the baseball bat? Yes. Christians should be happy people. Who is the treasure? Jesus is the treasure. Isn't he? And we say, oh, how I love Jesus. I found Jesus. Really? It's easy to say. But how does your life show that you really found the treasure? You see, in the spirit of prophecy, 
So, so let's go back. The man first found the treasure. So what is the treasure about? In the parable it says that the treasure is the gospel. But then the next paragraph, the next paragraph says, the greatest treasure was among them. The good news, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the light was there, but they rejected him while they thought they loved God. Israel found God, saw him working miracles, heard him preaching, yet procrastinated to give him full control, yet procrastinating to love him fully and trust him fully, and they all perished. This man, he finds the treasure, but then this is not enough. It's not enough to find the treasure. What is next? You find it, and then what do you do? You hide it. Well, is he selfish? Why would my grandpa hide it? My grandpa was selfish, obviously. I mean, he died and nobody got any benefit out of it. I hate it. I feel like going to Romania and just digging everything around there. Believe me. Except that somebody else owns that house right now. <laughs> they're going to come with a gun after me. And if they know what is there, then they search and they find it and I don't want that. Okay, that sounds selfish. Let's not talk about it. <laughs> so, so, why would he hid the treasure? You see, <clears throat> he is internalizing the gospel. He doesn't just talk about Jesus, but he digests the gospel. He takes it to the heart. Jesus says that man shall not live just with bread, but with any word. Jesus said, you got to eat my body. You got to drink my blood. What did he mean? You see, your word I hid in my heart. You need to, before you can do anything about it, you need to Taste the treasure. You need to put it to the heart. It's not enough just to talk about the treasure. When you find it, you need to just internalize it. You need to make it yours. <clears throat> and then what does he do next? He sells how much? He sells everything. How much is everything? Let's analyze. All but family. Am I right? We cannot sell our families. Come on. All but job. We need job because we need to pay the mortgage. Am I right? You see, Jesus told the rich young ruler, the guy says, what can I do to be saved? And Jesus says, sell? 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 Oh, come on. Come on. Why are you ashamed or afraid? or Why do you hesitate to say it? Sell how much? All? And he said, Lord, I, I can sell... 50 percent 70 95 and jesus was sad and he left how much do you need to sell in order to really get the treasure you do you do you see the point church we have a problem there you got to sell everything not just to love jesus but to make him the center the goal of your entire life not just to sell some things not just to sell what is bad you got to sell what is good too It's not just, hey, I serve Jesus. I gave up bad stuff. No. Willing to cut anything so the heart is entirely full with Jesus. Jesus said, he, <clears throat> let's go back a little. He who, computers are slow. Okay. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brother and sister, his own life cannot be my disciple. He is just the crowd. You got, is, Jesus is not talking about hating your parents or your children or your spouse. He told you to love them. Jesus is not talking about hating your job. He wants you to do a good job. Everything you do, you should do as you do it for God. But Jesus says, <clears throat> anything that comes between you and me is going to choke your relationship with me, eventually you will lose heaven. Because whatever you love and try to save, you will lose, including family. And whatever you give up for me, that's what you will save. Because I am the one who gave it to you, and I am the one who can keep it for you. 
You follow it? I hope you are with me. <clears throat> now listen, church. He, he says he sells everything, but how does he do it? How does he do it? Joyful. I got to give up everything for Jesus. I got to give it up. Oh, come on. He does it joyful. He lets go everything. Relationships, job, everything. He says, Jesus, I want you. And I don't care what I lose. I'm happy to lose, including my life. If I get you, that's the goal of my life. You see, <clears throat> why is he so joyful to give it up? You know why? Because he doesn't just talk about the treasure. He actually encountered the treasure. He doesn't just talk about Jesus, about Sabbath, about church, about diet, about he is the guy who has seen the treasure face to face. And church, if you don't encounter Jesus, you'll never have joy to give it up. And if you encounter Jesus, don't think that is enough. You encounter Jesus and then you stay there. Uh -uh. Next step, you got to sell all. Because it's not enough to encounter him. You need to get him. It's not enough to see the treasure. You need to get the treasure. You follow me? They go together. And it's not enough to do one of the two. You see, <clears throat> that's the reason God says about David, man after my, my heart. Because the Bible says that David fully devoted all his heart to seek the treasure. How much did he devote it? In the Hebrew it says he set his heart to seek God. He had a mindset. He had a goal. He was crazy. He said, you know what? This is the goal of my life. I don't care if I lose everything. I don't care if I sinned. It's wrong. But you know what? I'm going to get busy to get Jesus. And he falls and he gets up again and he goes that direction. And he loses his kingdom and he gets up again and he goes. Because he programmed himself as the ultimate goal of his life at any price to seek God. And he found him. That's what the disciples do. Seek my face and your face, Lord, I seek. That's what Paul did. 29 years of serving God as a, as a, as, as a prophet, as a disciple. 29 years. And at the end of 29 years, he says that I may know him. I want him. Daily seeking him. Daily seeking him at any price. Jesus became the motto, the guiding goal, the bulldozer. Jesus became the tank that he would just drive through anything and nothing could stop him. That's what I want. I'm not going to quit my job, but when I go to work, I go to seek Jesus. When I go to church, I don't go for a sermon. I don't go to keep Sabbath. I go to seek Jesus. When I keep Sabbath, I don't do it because he's right. I keep it because I find Jesus. You follow me, church? You can have all the other things, good things, but if you don't have the right reason, you'll never find the treasure and you'll never find salvation. <clears throat> so he finds it hides it internalizes it and then he sells everything why to buy the field that has the treasure Christ object lesson says that the field is the word of God listen church if we are serious about the treasure we are serious about study and prayer do you hear me let me repeat if you are serious about the treasure you are serious about studying the word and praying. Because you, you cannot find the treasure otherwise. <clears throat> Authentic Christianity is not only to talk about Jesus, it's not only to do the right things for Jesus. It is to encounter Jesus and that's not enough. But then you go back to the world again and again, seeking more of Jesus. And the more you know him, the more you want him, and the more you trust him, and the more you surrender, and the more you know him, and the more you love him. That's what happens in this parable. In order to get the treasure, he sells everything, and he goes and he buys it. <clears throat> we sometimes have a hard time to let go of everything we are willing to let go some things. But listen, we need to get less and less of the other things in order to get more and more of Jesus. 
<clears throat> Let's move on. Listen carefully. The, 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 the process of salvation is compared, or I'm going to compare it, to the strategy used in World War II. When, when they got the islands in the Pacific, you know what they did? The history says, if you read on the internet, the history says that they had a three-stage strategy. Three stages. Number one, they would go to the islands and soften the place. You know what that means? Bombs. Basically, weaken the enemy. Number two, they would go there to the islands and get a base in a corner. Just a little base. Establish a base, a place. Get their own place right there among the enemy. And number three, they would start a long process of capturing inch by inch, foot by foot, until they got the whole island. That's the spiritual life. Number one is very simple. Jesus is sending some bombs in our life. You follow me? I know you do. Jesus is allowing a hammer or a sledge, <laughs> sledgehammer in your life. And this is what we do. When we are hit by the bombs, it means that our heart is rough. And Jesus has to soften the place. You follow me, church? And what we, the way we usually respond, what we do, we basically start fighting whatever happens to our life and try fixing it. Don't we? We get desperate to fix the problem. And we don't wonder why. We don't look for the reason. We, we forget that all Things work together for the benefit of those who love the world. And yes, it may be Satan attacking you, but if God allows it, you don't need to understand. You just need to grow. Instead of growing, instead of allowing our hearts to be soft and surrendering 100%, we say, well, I love Jesus. Why would he allow that in my life? I need to fix it. Oh, Lord, please fix it. But we don't understand. That means that we may keep Sabbath, but we never surrendered. And God wants us to soften up. And people, sometimes, it takes them a lifetime to soften, and they get old, and they are hardly walking, and they are still proud. Nonsense. They are dying, and they are still proud. Yeah, uh -huh, that's us. So God would first soften the place, soften the heart. <clears throat> but then, he, number two, God is getting a place there in the island. He would come, and after he softens enough, he gets a base there. That's the conversion, usually. Oh, I got baptized. And do we confuse conversion with discipleship? Is not the same thing. When you get baptized and you give your heart to Jesus, I have bad news for you. You don't give your heart to Jesus. You give a base in your heart to Jesus. You follow me? I hope you do. You don't give your heart to Jesus. You let him have a corner in your heart. You just open the door, but your heart is divided among a million things. And you have Jesus and you have that and you have that and you are stressed above, about everything. And then God starts the third stage that is the most difficult part. That way, very, way difficult process, inch by inch, to take every single part of the island, all those territories that they are yours, to overcome them and take them for himself. When your heart is all surrendered, when Jesus has full control over it, then you die to self and he lives in you. Just then, you get the whole treasure. You need to consent daily to give all your territories, all your island to him. Just then, he can restore his image in you. That's biblical salvation. It's not, oh, I gave my heart to Jesus. Oh, that's nice. But it's not enough. <clears throat> you see... 
only those that don't only just open the heart, but give their, their territories to Jesus day by day. Only them, those will be saved. <clears throat> Paul says, I count all things to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count all things rubbish. Why? Why do you have to sell all those territories? Why do you have to give them up? That I may gain Christ. Church, they don't go together. You cannot have both. After Jesus gets a base in your heart, Jesus needs to basically get the whole heart. The crowd, they come to church, they keep Sabbath, and they give Jesus a, a place, but they never want to give it all. The disciple would give all, including his life, and never ask why or how much, because he wants Jesus. So, church, what are those territories? Let's go a little painful. Let's, 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 just, just, let's do it as painful as possible. What are those territories that we need to surrender? Pride. We get baptized. We are moved. We give it up. And as soon as we come out of the water, guess who comes out of the water too? Pride. We listen to a good sermon. We are moved. We have tears. And we give up our pride. As soon as we step through the door, guess what we look for and recover if we lost it? Our pride? Yeah, that's the reason we argue. If we had no pride, there would be no reason to argue. But because we are so right, we argue. Yeah. What else? Selfishness. Well, that's not about us. We are not selfish. Have it ever occurred to you that all we do is for us? Mm -hmm. We work for us, we eat for us, we sleep for us, we dress for us. We even pray for us. Help me, bless me, heal me, give me job, give me, 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 me. Isn't that selfishness? Jesus wants us to forget us and focus on him. And we need to sell that territory too. Control. We love to control everybody around. Doesn't matter in the church, in the family. We love to be in control. We want to have the last word. You know that stupid joke? The wife says, I don't mind my husband to be the head as long as I am the neck and I can turn the head. <laughs> and they never stop because everybody wants to have the last word. It's like who has the last word won the game. What is that? A little control. Not a lot. Just a little. A real disciple is the one who gives all control to God. He sells control. Those who never get the part three, they never get the treasure. Another one, temper. I don't have a temper. Yes, we do. In fact, I know a church in Atlanta, I'm not going to tell you what church, that they had the fist fight in the church and the ambulance and the police came. And the ambulance took one and the police took the other one. They had a holy fight. Mm -hmm. We are saints in the church. And when we go home, the picture changes a little. Huh? Not about us, great. Bad temper. I have a temper. And God has been working on me all my life. And I've been pleading with him to change my temper. And I remember Gabriel bothering me because he would lie. Hey, whatever you did, tell me the truth and I will forgive you. And he could not help, he would lie. But he, did, he was not a good liar. I would look to his face, I knew that he would lie. He said, tell me the truth. And I lost my temper and I called him names. And, and then I realized I should not lose my temper. So I went to him, I said, Gabe, would you forgive me? I lost my temper. And he says, Dad, you're right, I lied. I said, yeah, but I should have approached you differently. Not that, I, that you're right and I was wrong, but that the way I did it, it was wrong. He said, well, I forgive you. And then he looks to me, just do what you tell me to do. I said, what? Don't do it again. <gasps> Bad temper. Anger. We get angry about things, about church, about family, about, about the painter who painted my house. And we say 
Oh, how I love Jesus. We need to sell temper. We need to give up that territory too. Yep. More. Traditions. What is that about? We don't have traditions. Really? Whatever you do and becomes routine, that's a tradition. Did you know that? I'm not going to go because we don't have time. I'm not going to go in details. I just want to move on. All the forms that have no meaning, they become routine. They are cold and they don't help anybody. In fact, they do a lot of damage. Let's do another one. Gossiping. Gossip. Criticism. Judging people. I'm glad that's not in our church. Huh? huh? Don't ever talk about anybody. Don't ever allow your mind to judge anybody. If they are wrong, love them, pray for them. If somebody talks, don't listen because it's the same sin to listen as to talk. Did you hear me? Who called you to judge them? Did you pay on the cross for them? Who told you that you are the judge? When you do that, the spirit of prophecy says that you make yourself God. Uh-huh. Pointing fig fingers. I love this church because I don't think we have a lot of that here. But hey, if we have a little, we need to give it up. We are called to love and to help. And that's the single means to help people change. Judging them makes us feel good when we are sinful. We are the same and we, judging others, feel that we are a little better. We are not better. <clears throat> Another one, talking too much. Oh, that's not so bad. I don't have to sell that. Yes, you do. And I do. There are people, when they get baptized, they talk so much, 20 years later, they talk 20 times more. They love to hear the, voice of their, the sound of their own voice. And they always talk and never listen. And if they seem to listen, they don't listen. It comes through here. It goes through here. They think about what to answer. They don't listen. A disciple is the one who knows how to listen and to care. Yeah, that's some of the territories that we need to sell. If we really want to get the treasure... We are in bondage to these territories. And we find excuses, explanations to keep them because we love them. We nurture them as dogs nurture the fleas. You see, <clears throat> there are more of them. Bad thoughts. Do we do that? Jesus says that you don't have to do something wrong. You just have to think it and you did it. I told you before what my father said. I told my dad, hey, I cannot help. It comes to my mind. And my father said, hey, there are many birds flying over your head. Don't let them make a nest on it. When the thought comes, kick it out. Say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Go away. Sell it to Jesus. Bad, lustful thoughts. Resentful, hate, unforgiving spirit. Can it be that we, we hate somebody or we don't like somebody in our family or wherever we work or in the church? And then we sing, uh, how, how, how is the song? There is a song there that we'll hold hands together. Meet me in heaven, we'll hold hands together. What heaven if you hate him? Yeah. Love, you know, bad habits. Addictions, and I could name a bunch of addictions, a bunch of addictions. I don't want to go there, we don't have time anymore. <clears throat> Alcohol, smoking, drugs, TV, lots of TV, bad music to the point that sometimes we want to bring bad music in the church. All type of addictions. Internet addictions, Facebook addictions, Good food addictions, let me explain. You don't have to eat meat to be addicted. You can eat vegetarian food and be addicted. Uh huh. Did you hear me? No? Let me repeat it. Ah, you heard me. Okay. Good food addiction. Uh huh. Another one. 
nurturing hidden sins. Not gonna go there too much. You and God know. Loving our family. Is that bad? We got to love our children, don't we? Our spouse. Well, God told Abraham, sacrifice your son. Why do you think God did so? Could it be that he got to the point that he loved his son a little more than he loved God? And he did say he loves God, but he would not do for God what he would do for his son. You follow me? Can it be that our children become our gods? Whatever. Jesus says, unless you hate your family, you cannot be a disciple. You are a crowd. Whatever gets between you and God, that's your idol. That's your God. That's territories that we need to sell. And I am not saying that we should not love our family. Don't get me wrong. <clears throat> so, let's move on. Love for money. Is it wrong to have money? No, I want money too. And I want a lot of it. You too, be honest. Huh? Not all of you. Okay, that's okay. Give it to me. There is nothing wrong to have money. Abraham was filthy rich. The problem is the love for money. You see, the problem is that some people, listen carefully, and I am not talking about anybody in this church. You are immune to what I say now. You are holy people. Some people never have money. You can give them a hundred, a thousand, or ten thousand. They never have money. They are always in need. And even if you give them a lot, and if they get five jobs, and they get five salaries, they don't have money. You follow me? And even if they have another vacation, and another property or house, they don't have money. What is wrong in the picture? And some people don't say, I don't have money. But they always want to keep the money. That's either of them, love for money. God wants us to, to, to have a good life. But he wants us to love him more than money and focus on him more than we focus on things. God wants us to be good stewards. Sometimes it's not a problem that we don't have money. The problem is that we are not good stewards. How much we spend, how we spend, what are our priorities? You see, sometimes even when we have plenty, we don't learn how to not love them and how to use them for heaven. Bad subject. You may not like me anymore. That's okay. I forgive you. Another one. Another one. Listen carefully, church. Okay, we did another one. Laziness. Huh. People who never work. And others, workaholics, who work all the time. Never have time for family, never have time for church. I am busy. I got to work. Really? That's your God? Sports, politics. In our society, people have become so emotional about politics and sports that if you don't agree with them, they kill you. They become violent. Do you know what I'm talking about? Why would I care if it's this president or that president or this senator or that senator? Let me break it to you. None of them in our society care for you and for me anymore. I hate to say it. We got to love them. We got to pray for them. That's what the Bible says. But we should not get so emotional to start hating each other because that one doesn't agree with you. Remember, we are not called to trust people. We are called to love people. And we are called to trust God. The Bible says, cursed is the one who trusts in men. Did you hear me? Become so in love with politics and sports that we cannot miss a game. We would rather miss evangelism. That's your God. You need to sell that territory. If not, you will never get the treasure. You know, I've seen something that it, 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 it amazes me. People who keep Sabbath, and they would kill you for something that you did on Sabbath and they don't agree with, but they love the game. So they would be okay to watch the game on Sabbath. And if you tell them, why do you watch? They say, I don't watch, I listen. Duh. Yeah, I've seen that. Why? That's holy ground. That's their territories. Don't touch it. 
competitiveness. I had a friend, I'm not going to tell you his name, every time we'd play a game, he would have to win. If not, he would get angry, call you names, become violent. I said, man, calm down, it's just a game. I'm happy to let you win. No, I got to win. You should not let me win. I said, okay, win. Competitiveness. What is that? The third stage is the hardest part. It's easy to get baptized, but it's more difficult to sell everything. Sometimes, instead of being willing to die for Christ, we are willing to die to keep our territories that we nurture and love so much. Yeah. <clears throat> How do you do that? How do you sell everything in order to be able to buy the whole treasure? You see, anything that we don't sell, that's our God. That's our idol. So this is how we do that. When God created Adam and Eve, God created a God form, shaped, a shape of God in, in our heart. And he put God in the heart. A, sh a God shaped hole in the human heart. And nothing else can fill that goal, that hole. Whatever you put there, could be money, could be children, could be good, could be bad, could be addictions, could be pride, whatever you put there, is not going to satisfy. And the more you do it, the more unhappy you are. Because it cannot fill that shape. But God, besides giving that shape of God in our heart, God gave us blessings. And God gave us food. And gave us beauty. Not me. The ladies around, okay? And gave us health. And gave us intelligence. And gave us intimacy. And gave us children. And gave us jobs. And gave us nature. And gave us leadership. And gave us music. And gave us, you can name it. And this is what sin did. Sin took God out and put the blessings from God in. And that's where the tragedy starts. When we replace God with God's blessings. And you'll never be able to overcome or be saved before we give up those blessings and put back God in. God did not call you to 100% perfection. God called you to 100% surrender. He will take care of perfection. You need to take care of selling everything. You follow me, church? Are you with me? God did not call you to overcome. God called you to love him more than anything. And let him take care of everything else. He will. He will. He will. He's not going to lose the battle. He's going to get the whole island. But you need to surrender daily. And how he does it? None of your business. Your business? To invite him daily and sell everything to him. The terrible nature, the human nature, longs for things. Longs for territories. Longs for pride. And we are so blind that we don't realize who is on the throne. While we say that we love God, we are in control of our life. We are consumed, stressed with our things instead of being stressed with God. Instead of being crazy in love with God. You see, the blessings that were meant to be blessings became a curse. Instead of craving God, we crave God's gifts. That's what we pray for. How many times do we pray for God and how many times we, we pray for the gifts? Think about it. Church, if we really want to get the treasure, we need to be serious about this. We will neither desire heaven nor get heaven unless we desire God first. You see... <clears throat> If your joy is not in the Lord, then it's something else, and that's idolatry. You can serve God then and still be lost. To replace God with anything, it's apostasy. Well, <clears throat> we need to become serious about it. Anyone, I want you to listen carefully to this Bible verse. Do not, do not love the world. Or the things in the world. It doesn't say that it's wrong to have the things. It says that it's wrong to love the things. If anybody loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Listen, folks. Anyone who is not willing to sell all those territories that we just talked about has a big problem. 
The love of God is not in him. That's a false type of religion. Are you part of the crowd or are you a disciple? The crowd would follow Jesus, but they would not surrender. The disciples would follow Jesus and they would surrender. That's the difference. They all follow Jesus. What are you stressed about? What do you pray for? What do you work for? What do you spend your time with? What do you spend your money for? What, do you, what is the goal of your life? What is in your mind? What do you live for? That's the key. Nobody says, be perfect. Yeah, the Bible says be perfect, but in Hebrew actually it says, love perfect. And it doesn't mean that you love yourself perfect. It means that you love God with all your mind, all your heart, all your body, all your power, all your strength, everything you are, everything you have. You love God like crazy. And he will do it for you. He will get you there. How? No, no, you don't need to make any effort to get there. You don't need to be stressed about it. You just need to choose God daily above anything else at any price, as Abraham did, including your family, including your life, including your job. You need, God is not going to take it. Peter said, Lord, we have given up everything. And God said, Jesus said to him, anybody who gives up mother and father and job, you remember, is going to get 100 times here, and eternal life. Abraham was supposed to sacrifice his son. Did he really lose his son? God is not in the business to get your stuff. God doesn't need your stuff. God wants to save you. And he knows that we will not get the treasure before we sell everything else. So God wants you to renounce. He wants, me to re he wants us to renounce everything else so we can finally get the treasure. Anyone who is not willing to surrender everything has a false type of religion. Cannot be both, folks. John says you cannot love God and love the things. Jesus says the same thing. Cannot be both. No one can serve two masters. If you want to follow me, you've got to sell everything, Jesus says to the rich young ruler. <clears throat> you see... If we are serious about it, think about it. The Bible doesn't say kindly, well, if you don't fully love God, you love him too, just a little less. The Bible doesn't say so. It says, if you don't love me, you hate me. Well, we don't hate God. Oh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Because when God works softening our hearts and we oppose, that's what we do. We don't fight against problems. We actually fight against God. This is the principle, church. This is the principle. Hold on a second. Listen, either we love God and fully identify with him and surrender all, or we love something else and fully identify with the world and surrender partially. Cannot be both. Either God, we, either we love God or we hate him. God says, he who is not with me, he is halfway. That's what he says. Well, it's right there on the screen. He is against me. You are either with the crowd or a disciple. Either you sell all or it doesn't really matter if you sell just part of it. You are not with God. Wow. Folks, this changes the perspective altogether. It means that we either surrender all or we lose our time. Yep. Let me ask you, are you a disciple? Are you willing to surrender all? Nobody died in the wilderness in Israel for not overcoming Jericho, for being too weak, for not being perfect, for not... Nobody died. They died because they didn't trust God. Are you willing to trust God and surrender all? Are you willing to basically daily sell all your territories and let God control 100%. Basically, walk with him, die, let him live in you, let him make all the decisions. Don't talk before you talk to him. Don't act before you talk to him. Just let him live in you. Are you willing to do that? Well, what is your treasure? Jesus says, 
that the man in the story sold how much? All. And then he bought the treasure. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? They sold some too. And they perished. Remember Achan? He gave some, but he perished. That should tell us a lot. When those things are in the heart and is not God, God could be in a part of the heart, then we cannot please God. Whatever we do for him, including Sabbath, our religion is only a form of godliness, but without power. The more we surrender all those territories, the closer we get to him, the more he can enter in our heart, the more territory he can get in our heart. The more then we become like him, he can restore us back in his image, like in the beginning, and we start reflecting his character. You should have said amen. Are you willing to surrender all? Well, <clears throat> if this is your desire today, if you want to surrender, we don't talk about, listen, my father used to tell me a story. My father said to me, son, Satan doesn't need your heart. Satan doesn't need your house. Satan doesn't need your family. He needs a corner to drive a nail in the wall. I said, what do you mean? Well, if Satan can put a nail in the wall of your house, that nail belongs to him. So he can come day and night. Hey, I have business. I got to put my coat in the nail. I have business. I got to, tie to, to, to clean the nail. I have, and he's going to come in and out as long as he has a little nail in your house. And my father will say to me, nothing in your house should belong to Satan because then your whole house belongs to him. You follow? Religion doesn't have power because we talk about God, we do the things for God, but we don't surrender. Only when we surrender, then our church will have tremendous power. We don't talk about human power that we can plan and control. We talk about things beyond human intelligence. We talk about godly things. Those will happen when we surrender. And that's the call to discipleship. If this is your desire today, if you want to bring God back in the center of your heart, if we want to give him the whole heart, sell everything and get the treasure. If that's your desire today, if you found the treasure and you want to sell everything and buy the treasure, God is calling you today to make a decision right now. Not that you will do it today, but that you'll do it daily. That's a different story. That every morning you'll make time for prayer. That every morning you'll make time for study of the word. Not to do a duty, I got to eat my broccoli, but to seek God. Every day you'll invite him in your life. Every day you'll give him control and you say, Jesus, I don't like it, but I'm going to plead with you that you work against me and I give it to you, take control. And if I forget, remind me. I give myself to you. I give my house to you. Every day, surrender. He's going to remind you. When you do that, he's going to start working. You may not be perfect. Nobody is perfect except me. Nobody is perfect. But the point is this. As long as you do that, he's going to take inch by inch until he gets you. That's good news, isn't it? That's the best possible news. Because you get the treasure. And if you got the treasure, you got it all. And if you don't get the treasure, you lost it all. That's what salvation is about. If God is calling you today to make that decision from today, every day, I want you to stand up with me. Take a few minutes and ask God that this is going to last. You cannot do it, but he can do it. Ask him to do it. If you want to stand up with me, let's have two minutes of quiet surrender, quiet prayer. And after that, I will have a prayer of dedication for you and for all of us. Let's pray quietly. Amen. Father in heaven, 
This is the best news possible. We are not called in our effort to change ourselves, but we are called to sell everything. We are called to surrender daily. We are called to give it to you daily, to invite you in and to let you be in control daily. And you promised that you will do everything else in us. You will give us a new heart, a new mind. You will give us victory. You will give us eternal life. Not because of who we are, but because of who you are. This is the gospel. Father, we make a decision today. As individuals, as church, all of us right now, as we stand, you know the hearts. And we decide that daily we want to make you the center, the goal, everything in our life. We decide that everything that we have, everything that we have, we want to give it to you at any price, including life. Please take it from us, whatever it may cost. And may we be filled with your presence. May this church reflect your character and become a light. May Jesus be restored back in our hearts, in our families, in our church. In Jesus' name we pray and we know that you answered. We praise you, we love you, we thank you, we worship you. Amen.